Um, um, I was going to, I, I guess I was kind of interested in this. Who I are you, Simon? Where uh, are you okay. from? Um, my name's William Burns, and I'm from a, a learned society called the Society for General Microbiology. Um, and so we do a lot of stuff with infectious disease, and that's what we're looking at at the moment. And in fact, we're trying to, how, how can we engage the scientific community to, to work on a particular issue, which we think is a priority? And so I was going to kind of ask a general question on that. How do you get um, volunteers or to become activists? And the question comes from the fact we'd like researchers, we're sort of thinking about trying to get scientific researchers to get together and write lots of good grant applications to government agencies on particular types of infectious disease research and sort of bombard the agencies with them, um, the, the grant giving agencies. But getting them to do that is incredibly difficult, even though it's something they do every day in their professional lives. So I, I, I don't think they're as committed as Greenpeace activists, perhaps, but how can we inspire their commitment to help Great us? question. I mean, you'd love some more scientists, activists, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. Um, we've, we've only got a handful of scientists in the science unit. Um, I think um, it's, it's a interesting question. Um, you can't start uh, from the top. Um, Volunteering is an uh, amazing source of uh, energy and, and, ch and uh, potential change, but it's, um, it's, a, it's about real people, it's about relationships, and those relationships have to start somewhere. <coughs> um, so it's, it's interesting that you ask that question because ultimately in what's often called a ladder of engagement, um, asking people for that level of commitment is often seen as a very high ask, a very uh, high bar um, for people to cross. So we start somewhere. Um, and that's where things like um, Change.org and Greenpeace actions and events and digital comms begin, and we hope to develop. So um, it's we, I don't know if we've ever successfully um, pulled volunteers out of a high bar ask straight up off the bat, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely something to develop. And the volunteers that Greenpeace have um, have a very real network and community. They, they, they engage with real people um, and are looked after um, by, by a particular department. Um, and I think those human relationships are really what matter. You need, a, you need a personal investment in what's going on. So I'd say that that's the, the resources to look after people um, and to manage their expectations in a, in a uh, reciprocal relationship are very key. And then your program can develop from there. I don't think there's any right or wrong way to do that. Um, yeah. we, we love a good ladder of engagement at Wontcoms. Yeah. But our, our ladder <laughs> is shaped like a pyramid. <laughs> That's an in-joke. Um, I think the plan was we were going to bring the first panel back, actually. So let's oh bring sorry. the first panel back and let's hear from the amazing Sophie Jenkinson, who was on the first panel, who very politely put her hand up. Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, you just have to kind of catch my eye. Let's hear from Sophie and then we're going to go to the back to Jonathan. Am I asking a question from here? Well, you, you know, make a contribution. But use a microphone okay. so the live stream people can hear. Um, I was going to ask, um, so we, we talk about all the time, um, like we don't ask people to do anything apart from download our report and read them. Um, so we've been talking about how we can, as a think tank, ask people to do things. And if, if we are going to do that, how and what are we going to ask them? And are we going to ask them to sign a petition? <coughs> and you know, there's, there's so many different kinds of people that read our work. Um, how do we st stop just being like a broadcast medium and start becoming like an engagement medium. Yeah, let's totally ask Brie that. Because <laughs> I'm always, almost every report that crosses my desk, I think, what would be the change.org petition for this that could work? And then I might exchange a few emails with Johnny and then it, it, we just can't come up with an immediate enough ask because ah. all our stuff seems to be quite systemic or in the future or, or, or boring. <laughs> and I just, I, I sort of think that, 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 that you guys are great when you're doing stuff that's very immediate and tangible and if it's quite interesting as well that helps mm. but but is, that, is that a posh way of saying you're too intellectual <laughs> well I think there's definitely an elite versus popular tension isn't there between yeah. our, uh, <laughs> our respective um, models of change if I can politely put it that way <laughs> okay <laughs> um, yeah I would say I'll, yeah, ask them to start a petition um, but there's also the sort of opportunistic moments isn't there so around say expenses I think we had this conversation about, you know, around just something like that's in the news and you've got the policy, you've got the, the, the weight to support it. 
if one of your people readers is someone who's got got a great story or just really cares passionately about the issue <laughs> encourage them ask them to start a petition to use that they've got your policy details they've got their passion and they've got you know online tools to 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 do that so i think there's i feel like there's a there's a missing link here because hearing the first panel talk about all the great work you've been doing but i was really sad to hear that none of you mentioned change.org obviously um but just to, sort of seeing that there's huge potential there for sort of using your supporters and the people who you're who are reading your reports and tying that together with action so you're putting out all this incredibly valuable information and trying to sort of pivot to an ask or to an action that's tangible. I can see what you mean about the, ur the urgency stuff, but I'm sure it's not all that boring. Well. It's an interesting question, isn't it? To what extent are think tanks supposed to be campaigning or simply putting out interesting information that enables other people to do the campaigning? That's not a necessary a question to ask the panel, but that's my observation. Totally, totally. Uh, Jonathan and then Jeff. Okay. For those of you listening on the live stream, Jonathan saying that's his question. Wait for the microphone. Come on, you used to work here. You should know how this <laughs> building works. Come on. <laughs> yeah, just the general how can researchers make themselves useful to people like change because the change model is fantastic. Real people, real change. Saying real seems to make things more real somehow. So I say real people, real change. Of course it never does. <laughs> There's a tip for you. Don't write real ever. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting to know when you're you know, when you're going through the process of you've got a real person right and they're going to go out and make the case for their petition is there a way of feeding in facts information that's going to help them make that argument in a way that's more substantial and i think that's something a lot of people in the room would find useful to know uh, yeah definitely you kind of probably just need to point us in the direction and point the, the, the people in the direction of where they can find that information i mean change we are a platform we want to empower people to create that change we are by no means policy experts in, in any particular area. We've all got different backgrounds. And we've only got a very small team. There's only three people, three to five people in the UK. And uh, 2,000 petitions start every month in the UK. The, the volume is huge. Um, but if you see people tweeting about a petition, you see someone covering you know, a relevant issue to something that you're writing a report on and you have that information, you know, try and get in touch with them, tweet at them, communicate them, see if we can get in touch with them. If you say, actually, we've got this amazing piece of policy research that would really add some weight to, your, to their campaign, that's, you know, actually what they really need. Um, you know, these are just individuals who care about the issues, starting a campaign, often looking for that and seeking that. So if we can help facilitate that, we'd love to. Um, but equally, you know, if you see people tweeting about it, tweet back and reach out to them. Okay, let's take Jeff and then... Right, so uh, three kind of uh, various points. Uh, one of the first observations um, I would have, or reactions, I guess, to Bree's presentation in particular, was uh, one of the things that you mentioned was having a good story, but actually what you were focused on was having a credible spokesperson. And I think that that's where the change.org, because it empowers people to start their own petitions, works really well. You have very credible spokespeople, which is sometimes what think tanks might be missing. Um, so I guess I would wonder, how do think tanks create, find, create, I don't know, work with credible spokespeople might be an interesting question, enable. Um, another question that I guess I would have in terms of more general trends, and maybe this goes back to Leonora and Jonathan's comment of how much should think tanks be working on, on uh, uh, be being advocacy organizations. And I guess I wonder if we also want to be thinking about where where are their innovations in, well, I call them splainer, uh, like explaining websites. So uh, I would really like people or th to think about, I don't know if people have seen Ezra Klein's new venture at Vox.com, which is very much designed to explain the news, not necessarily break the news. And they, they use flashcards, not infographics. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and to what, level that create, you know, that's another type of model. I'll leave it there. All right, I've got three people in the room. Uh, I've got Nick on the panel, and I want to come to Joe as well. So like a four speaker warning to Joe that we are coming to New York in four speakers time. So uh, women at the end, down there. Hi, my name's Stacey. I have an international development company called Taisha Consulting. And looking at this from a development country point of view, I'm, we do quite a bit of advocacy work, and la most recently we've been working in Nigeria uh, with women's groups in the Delta region. 
And so I'm just wondering, that's an area where there's technology uptake is very minimal. And most of the things we've heard about today is how can we use technology to promote advocacy. Can you tell me some of the examples of maybe where you've had success with limited technology? Great, who wants to come in on that or shall I abuse my position and try and answer it? Um, there's a colleague here from South Africa, um, uh, Siobhan, who works at a think tank. And, and the thing about South Africa is um, there's a social medium called uh, Mixit, which works on Java-enabled phones, which people often share. They'll have three or four people um, uh, sharing one Java-enabled phone rather than smartphone. It's not because they can't afford the smartphones, because they can't afford the um, cost of the data to, to download it. But Mixit is, is by far the biggest uh, social network in South Africa um, amongst um, young black um, activists. But, uh, and Twitter and Facebook are tiny in comparison. So although, of, co of course, digital uptake can be smaller in developing countries, I think you find that different platforms work for different groups in different countries. Right? Okay, let's take these two. Um, hi, Eleanor Kelly from Open Society Foundations. Um, I wondered how some of the panel feel about what we kind of internally call the upworthy effect, that in an attempt to make our content stand out, it's kind of a race to the bottom, actually, and that our audiences are becoming really numbed by our attempts to make our content stand out. Um, some of us even feel internally that um, actually just going the kind of more straightforward way might actually make it stand out even more in the future. I wonder if this is something that you've encountered and, and kind of how you feel you should respond to it. Okay, hold on to that, especially you two and you at the end. Um, my name's Tim Jeffrey. I'm a, a researcher on employment issues as well as a news editor, politics editor. Um, and so this is kind of a plea as well as a sort of uh, a sort of rallying call for um, to answer that question about how think tanks start affecting stuff in the world, in a sort of real world, to use that term. Um, I think maybe the answer is a little bit that um, democracy is something you, you do as well as a, as a situation you're in. Um, and so when the minister responsible for uh, social security um, is using all sorts of dodgy statistics, you know, there's a reason why the statistics are out there to challenge him. Mm. Um, and that has an effect on, on, on people's lives. So I, I just think there is a bit of an opening there. Um, you know, perhaps not for, for, for people in policy communications on their own, but in partnership with, um, you know, interested non-specialists, right? Uh, members of the, the press trying to do uh, new things, uh, like, you know, start new platforms, for instance. Um, <laughs> to, you know, really take on that kind of democratic responsibility and say yeah. this is about opening up the processes by which policy is made so that we can get more interesting voices, so that we can get, you know, benefit from, from o you know, having more people looking at these problems. Okay, who wants to come in on either democracy or the upworthy effect? Uh, yeah. Go for it. Um, really interesting, actually. Something that we're trying to do at the moment is make our data available. So when we do our new website, I'm very passionate about showing the working out, basically, and saying, if you want to come along and play, look at our sums, look at our data, do your own thing with it. Create pieces of data visualization that I'm not clever enough to do. That would be great, and I think that level of transparency is, is a good thing. Um, the idea of think tanks as campaigning organizations very hard to boil down into um, a changed old petition that is actually true to what we were doing. Um, a big part of my job is trying to make infographics that don't vaguely distort what the big, big picture is, um, and that's what I do tend to struggle with. But I think we can play a, mo a role in myth busting. Um, a lot of the time, you'll see maybe politicians claiming certain things about, I don't know, job stats, and you'll say, well, actually, that's only part of the picture or they need to look at this um, so I think think tanks can play a role in democracy by saying hey we need to be looking about this too and that's not quite right um, and I suppose we sort of campaign in a slightly quieter way um, and neither is right or wrong I just for me um, I just think I would probably never get my organisation to do a petition um, but we can think things in maybe a more subtle way yeah and I think that probably speaks to Nick's first slide about authenticity 
you know, how authentic is it really for a for a think tank to um, take over a, a building without permission? And, you know, mm -hmm. I think when I last saw you, uh, you said something like, um, you know, direct action. It's not for everyone, but you sort of shrugged your shoulders, which I thought was the mo one most wonderful understated uh, line I'd ever heard. Um, the upworthy effect. Um, do you mean? Um, sort of infographics and sort of smaller pieces of um, sort of digital comms. I had this problem with um, an economist I worked with once who um, hated it when I did it because he thought I was dumbing it down. Um, and a lot of the time I was just taking things directly, you know, even the phrasing directly out of something that was in his executive summary. And I was like, this can be taken out of context in an infographic as well as, as, as easily as it can be taken out of context in your work. Um, I personally don't think that that making things easier to understand is dumbing them down. It's less it's less about the people producing the content, it's more about the audience consuming it, and the idea that you're kind of numbing your audiences a little bit. What with too much? With with the sort of kind of trying to kind of sex up something that really just can't be, um, and the sort of I mean clearly the upworthy headlines are sort of the dramatic end of it, but trying to convert something that is a kind of serious issue into something a bit more dramatic that people would pay yeah. attention to that actually we're maybe doing the contents maybe doing the content to disservice and maybe numbing our audiences a little bit i mean i think that to some extent is doing the audience a disservice because i mean audiences are intelligent and they can take things from things what they what they want to take from them um it's, it's the same as a tabloid might make something sound more interesting or a headline but if you really want to read the content you still go and get the content i think it's more about providing different means of entry so I would never just do, I would never probably use Upworthy. I personally don't really like it, but I, w I think if you're going to do a BuzzFeed or something like that, you don't just do that on its own. It's part of a menu of different things. So you might get some people from there, and then somebody else who doesn't want to engage with that at all might just go straight to a website and download the PDF. So I think it's just, if people don't want to engage in it, they won't be numb by it, they just won't engage in it. Sounds like horses for courses. Matt, dumbing down or sexing up well policy if exchange. If I could just discuss. actually um, add to one of the Sophie's points there is is basically um, newspapers have been doing the sort of upworthy Buzzfeed thing forever, you know. So um, I don't think I don't think any of this is is new in that sense. And um, actually, if we if we're talking about straightforward in in the sense of just traditional newspaper sort of coverage and the like, th you'll still find that that's by far and away the still the most important aspect of think tank comms. Get, getting an article in in uh, on the Telegraph website or any of the main newspaper websites is is still far and away more important than getting the, the, the well. It still brings in far more than anything we can do on social media or anything like that. So in that sense, you know, the traditional approach does in fact still work. But um, uh, I, I think I, I sort of yeah, with the whole Buzzfeedification thing, I, I honestly feel that you know, especially with the the, um, the social media angle, in that people are now consuming. Um, our reports through things like Twitter. I think that stuff like BuzzFeed has shown us the best way to bring people in that way. So I think in the same way that we, we kind of expect a newspaper headline to be, you know, not necessarily the most um, correct way of presenting a report or something like that, uh, you know, it's sh sh more short and to the point and a bit sexier. I think you're going to find that that's exactly the way people will think of your sort of BuzzFeed headline for your Twitter um, link. Okay, Nick's been waiting for ages to come in, and I know Joe is waiting too. So Nick first, and then uh, we go to the sexy Joe in New York. <laughs> uh, yeah, not to take too much time, but um, one thing that seems to cut across a lot of what people are asking and people are saying is there's like a really important distinction that often forgets to be made between content and data. So there's two very different things that you have at, at your fingertips when it comes to digital tools. You've got the content itself, which, as I said, is boss, um, and the best content will win. And that's where Upworthy are exploiting different types of content. But the data tells you what that means. Content is great. Upworthy hits are great. Twitter trends are great. But if you don't know who they are that are behind those uh, trends, or you don't know wh who is interested or who you're reaching or, or when it's happening or where it's happening, you might find that you're trending on Twitter, which looks great in London, but actually it's 17-year-olds in Turkey, because you haven't got the data. And you can get it. It's freely available. It's not freely available if you hand it over necessarily to a third party and say, BuzzFeed, will you look after my content for me? You won't necessarily find out everything you want to know. But you can get all this data 
And that's part of the reason why sometimes encouraging people to give you some uh, personal information like email or something like that can actually be really useful because you can track things over time. And there are a lot of third parties that will help you do this. Um, and I still think it's um, something that's really important because a lot of people come up to me these days and say, I want to make a viral video, which is still an awesome joke that gets told at Greenpeace. They come up, I want to make a viral video. Okay, <laughs> um, you want to make it viral, but you think you have a great content piece, you think you have a great idea, but you don't necessarily know how it works. We don't know what data you're going to exploit at the end of the day. So um, you really have to push back on them and say, well, what, what's the purpose of this piece? And you have to justify it in data terms before content terms. Maybe the content's really rich and valuable, and maybe this piece really needs to get out there and the world needs it. But if you can't find a way for that to work, if you don't know what buttons you're going to press and how you're going to exploit that opportunity, then that content doesn't ever need to get made because it's never going to get seen. So, yeah, I push back a little bit, and it's a little bit controversial. It's definitely in Greenpeace telling directorate sometimes that the report launch isn't going to go on the internet because no one's going to read it because they haven't thought about who, who they want to read that report. Um, beautiful content. Don't forget the data. That is just the kind of controversy we love at Wonk Tongs. Okay, we're going to New York, and then we're going to take this chap here at the back. Joe. Thanks. Um, so I wanted to circle back to uh, Bree's comment earlier about how people respond to um, stories and not facts. So when you're at a, um, when you're at a think tank, those are uh, those are hard words to hear, right? Because we're uh, we're really most interested in the uh, get, kind of getting the research out, um, and so we have tried experimenting a bit with uh, you know with telling stories and also doing research, but it's it's hard to find that balance and to figure out how you end up telling a story that's not just stories or not just policy research. So I wondered if you had suggestions about how it is that you uh, that you find that balance and walk the line between those uh, those two pieces. Do you want to answer that? That felt like a question. Yeah. A challenge. Well, um, I'm sure no. it's New York <laughs> solve that problem. Yeah, send me over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Um, no, it's a, it's a really good point. Um, but I think it's not an either or um, because, for example, you know, farmers' campaign it had it had the data behind it. You know, twenty four thousand girls at risk in the UK. I don't know that. She didn't know that. Came from somewhere. You know, it's about feeding in behind that. So the story is the face, and then if you can feed in the data around that, I would be interested to know if you if you have have examples of that, or you've done that, or if you've seen anyone do that really well. But you know that, and that goes for the same about. It's not that think tanks should be campaigning, but they should be feeding into campaigning, forming you know providing the data and the information into the ecosystem of campaigning and democracy, and you know that's how it all feeds in. Some chap. There's a, there's a chap nodding vigorously over there in the corner. Yes, totally. You bring the emotion, we'll bring the rationalness. This is yeah, a marriage made right. in heaven, surely. Exactly. It's the future, definitely. Right, um, Nick, and then please yeah. pass the mic back okay. to his colleague at the back. I mean, I, I think there is a, a question for the communicators in the room. Has anyone, uh, can we have a show of hands for anyone that's considered at the same time as they're considering their PR and media outreach? has considered their NGO outreach and which NGOs they're going to bring on to their campaign to actually to, to bring it through. So they've got two, three. Okay, so it's, I mean, I think, I think actually we should, as Wontcoms, that should be a central part of what we're thinking about when we're talking to the researchers. And so, uh, yeah, do you want to? It's really interesting because we do, at the Nuffield Trust, we will um, engage quite a lot of people before we put reports out in a way that we didn't when I was at the SNF so much. Um, possibly because we're more focused on, well, we are focused on one kind of discrete area of policy. But often the reason for that is not necessarily to lend support to a campaign, but it's actually to help get help it go further. So we'll, p we'll give them advance sight of our reports and our releases and stuff in order for them to then put out their responses, which helps the whole thing go further. So it's, it's kind of like what sort of Natalie was talking about in terms of, you know, the getting the kind of um, information out there and the kind of democratizing thing rather I think than a campaigning side of things doesn't mean we couldn't do it but I don't think that again I, I'm, I work for a pretty wonkish kind of organization I couldn't see us doing it but that's how we use kind of NGOs and um, and not just NGOs but other other stakeholder organizations great just pos I just wanted Go to finish off on my point <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> um, I mean it, it feels like to me like emails it feels <laughs> it feels to me of like think tanks um, if we're talking to researchers, we we should we're in organisations that are there to bring change. I, I, I don't think at that state at that point we're 
were talking a different language to researchers? Why would they be working in a think tank if they don't want change to happen? And I think actually we need to move away from just thinking about communications goals, but to, to influencing goals. And that's what we should be sort of positioning ourselves as influencers and helping them influence. They need to, to pull every different trick out to make that change happen. And it doesn't need to be them that's passing these messages on, but I, I, I think too often, you know, I'm as guilty as anyone else of this. I don't, we don't do that, but I, I think I miss a trick quite often on these things, and we should all sort of think about that. Carl Allen, I live between London and Trinidad. Um, there appears to be a gap here. There are lots of things, thanks, charities and other bodies, universities, which right, do a lot of research on big issues. But for me, you know, to get to that information is hard. Well, it's not hard for me, but for a lot of people who this information should be reaching, I mean, why should they have to look at Besides of 14 think tanks, 23 universities, 50 charities, to get an idea of the scale and intensity of the big issues in England. That's ridiculous. Also, now that citizenship is now going to be a serious part of the curriculum, why isn't there a single site which will serve that citizenship curriculum where, where teachers and students can draw on to understand the big issues in England. So yeah. one short point again. Um, I'm a specialist in communication, well, used to be. So in the old days when we only had word, the UN we used the word, we had seven qualities which we ascribed to it, comparable, usable, understandable, seven qualities. So now digital adds a few other qualities to what you do. However, when you break down a report from the full report, executive summary, evidence, um, conclusions, recommendations, analyses, the link between the two has not been, what shall I say, well made. Yes, we started to use digital in it, but the link, the link has not been well made, and there doesn't appear to have been sufficient research, theoretical research, as to what models can be used in what situations. Mm -hmm. So we're still experimenting a bit, but it nobody appears to be thinking it out. Great, thank you. A real plea to make it simple and easy for end users, definitely. And, th and surely there's a sense in which collaboration is key at that. I mean, overlap in think tank work, you know, think tanks, they're not, they're not natural collaborators, really. We found that, I think, over the last year. Um, guy down here with his hand up. Hi, thanks. My name's Lee Bailey. I work at the Revenue Watch Institute. Um, my question is, uh, I'm relatively sort of new in my position, and um, I have one colleague in communications, and there's about 70 people in the organization. So I'm really curious to know what sort of the ratio of comms people to total staff in a lot of the organizations represented here are. I don't know if there's been any data on that ever <laughs> gathered, but maybe just anecdotally, a few of you could share that. Um, I'll fill another show of hands coming up <laughs> in a second. I, it just, you know, it, it occurs to me every day, God, if I had another person to help me do this, or, you know, you were talking about one person, one job, or my team of five did X, Y, and Z, and I don't have that luxury. I don't know how many people do. I, I think it really varies. I'm just trying to get a sense of, of the universe of, of that kind of staffing. Okay, hands up, smartphone in the air, if you uh, think two to 70 sounds like a worse ratio for you. So if you have uh, fewer comms people than two, more researchers, policy people than 70, put your hand up. That's the RSA hand gone up. <laughs> where, where are you from? Shout out. Uh, so I work at ODI. ODI, okay. Okay, so within ODI. Okay, it looks like the consensus in the room is that you are, yeah. <laughs> 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 about five million users and one comms person. Five million users, five million and, users one and one comms to person. To one comms person. How's that for me? <laughs> 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 That's a pretty good ratio. 
Yeah, we did an event on staffing, actually. It's worth going back to the Wontcoms blog, actually, and having a look at the um, staffing event that we did, because I think all of us would like more staff. I think that's the one thing we all share. So uh, how do you make best use of the headcount that you that you know that you've got and again joe has made an awesome uh, uh infographic to show you all the kind of qualities that you need to cover off uh, in a comms team so it's well worth looking up okay uh, we've got two hands ba at the back here hi i just want to comment on the staffing issue um this is i've worked in communications in the private sector in government and as a consultant in international development and I'm working with governments and academic institutions and donors that I engage with on a regular basis, what I find is the common thread is they don't understand what communications actually is. And that's our job is, if you're a communications professional, to educate from the top all the way down to the bottom of what it is, how they can actually feed into it, and what the impact of communications is, and what the results are without it. So that's something that I run into on a constant basis, and I think it becomes our job to actually try to get our everybody that's in the organization on our team. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Victoria Silva, and um, I have worked in professional communications, but I'm currently more in the kind of people organizing sphere. Um, I used to be head of communications at the UK Drug Policy Commission, and I've also worked at Marie Curie. And I'm really interested in Richard's point about end user and collaboration. It's um, it's a year on since one comes, and I've been watching this space um, attentively. It's, it's very exciting to see professional practice talked about in this way. But one of the things that I've um, learned when you're doing research and launching big slabs of research is how that stuff influences professional practice, you know, whether it's clinical practice or whatever. And I think in two years' time, I'd like to see Wontcoms getting actually, you know, the clinicians and where the, wherever the evidence is that's directed. You know, in, in my arena, it's been um, mainly social care and health. But, you know, when you can really see that the, you know, nurses, doctors, GPs are actually changing practice as a result of evidence and research and getting them in this communication loop, I think, about how the comms is done could be a really powerful thing indeed. Yeah, I think it's fair to say it was not our intention to set up a global professional community of practice. Uh, <laughs> when we met here a year ago, we thought we were going to do one event, uh, and someone had the bright idea of using Montcoms as a hashtag, and uh, it sort of snowballed from there. But th I mean, that is definitely what we're doing. It is a global network of professional practice. Um, and uh, uh, let me plug the um, LinkedIn group again, because I think some of the best collaboration and, and knowledge sharing happens uh, on our LinkedIn group. And it ranges from some of the most existential questions that people ask with sort of, you know, chin stroking, head scratching uh, uh, moments to some really practical stuff like, what do you pay for your media monitoring and, and things like that? And r really kind of practical resource sharing as well. Because another thing I think that, pe that people said a lot when they came to Wontcom's events first was, those infographics look amazing, but I bet they cost a fortune and you have to commission them out. And then we just shared some web links and a few events later, everybody was doing them for themselves. And, you know, so we, we definitely can kind of um, make a lot of progress by sharing. Did you want to come in? Yeah, this just this Luke so from the uh, yeah. RSA. Um, just building on that, um, that comment, I just wanted to ask whether um, on evaluating the impact of your comms at the end of whether you put out your report and it's your press release or your infographic or your tweet or your prezi, um, whether any of you have developed a kind of typology or different types of communication and the impact that they have had. So I, I, I get the impression that there's quite a lot of activity in terms of you have your traditional reports, press, press release, plus public affairs strategy. And then we've, I don't know, personally I've now trying to get up to, sp up to speed on things like and um, adding a BuzzFeed and adding an infographic and et cetera, ends, et cetera. Luke, it never ends. But which, in terms of which ones have the most impact or, you know, if I speak to my other colleagues around the RSA and go, well, actually, this might not be a report. Why don't we try and develop an app or why don't we develop some a completely different way of communicating? What I would like to turn to is a, some sort of typology or different types of communication. And, and I've got that sort of, I can go to them and say, well, hang on a minute. Let's go right back to the beginning and uh, think about this in a different way. Uh, and I think that's very much linked through to the impact that it has at the end and evaluating that impact. 
Yeah, and it's very comforting for us as well to know that the organisation that pioneered RSA animates worries that they're not doing enough cool digital stuff. So that, that makes us all feel a lot better about it. Leonora, you... I know, I was just saying, project here... One Microphone. Can I... Can I... Yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to say this actually earlier about the Upworthy thing. Um, so there's so many different things you can use. I think sometimes it's not even about the channel, it's about the timing. Um, so we did an infographic just before the budget, and it just it went really far because of the timing. Um, and we could never have got a headline in the Telegraph for that. So while um, like a traditional press release and um, a piece in the Telegraph is sometimes more important to funders and sometimes more important to the research team, it's not always the thing that will get you what you want. Um, I think in terms of measuring that, um, there's obviously loads of things like Nick did earlier on, um, like the Twitter stats, so you can you know how many times things have been mentioned and shared, and you know how many times things have been viewed. Um, I think it. I think the sharing, finding out how far things have gone. So when somebody just clicks a link and reads it, you have no way of knowing if they shared that with people, whereas you can sort of track that on um, digital. So I think that's something that there are, as tools develop, I think measurement tools are also developing so there's quite a lot for now for twitter in terms of getting s you can get all sorts of charts um trending and and sort of you can put into um i can't remember the name of it but there's one way you can put in like four different think tanks and you can see who's getting more followers and you can see who's dropping off and so those measurement tools are, are starting to improve a lot as the technology is starting to improve so i think like with the tools it's always worth like googling around for like new measurement and evaluation tools because they are there and sometimes you can do it with, like, clout is one way you can do it with more than more than one channel, which is always useful. And just while well, I've got Go the mic, yep. uh, I wrote a blog about um, some some aspects of how you can bring, how you should actually bring all of these different things together, because one, one indicator on its own doesn't always tell you the story, actually. We should be running integrated campaigns and, and thinking about across the piece <coughs> the indicators on the way to actual change, because we're never going to know necessarily whether the thing that we did made change happen, maybe change that or can say that we can't often. Um, but actually we can see lots of the steps on the way through these kinds of tools. So <coughs> if we can kind of look at what the different indicators that might spell success in a general sense, then we can do a bit of extra research to see w what actually happened there. I think, I think we are research organisation. Sometimes we have to research how we're doing at, or at getting impact and learn from that. Hi, my name's Rob. I'm from Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, it's great to be here. Inspiring, learn a lot. Well done, guys, after one year. Um, <laughs> it's been really interesting listening to things, and I, I think that we can sort of, I felt that we could sort of summarise that what we want in want com as want commas, we want more staff who can do stories where content is boss um, that induce change. And I'd like to propose that there's a sort of campaign, or at least one part of a campaign that we could run ourselves, perhaps not on change.org, but, but <laughs> something that we could work on, which is trying to, and I think this is something that's come up, which is trying to convince funders about the added value of comms, which requires us to evaluate what works, tell them what works, and get them to fund what works, rather than ask us to do PDFs. Madonna style. Yeah. Um, let's let's get them to fund the Lady Gaga of Wonkoms. Um, <laughs> so th that's that's my suggestion, and that actually is completely stolen from Richard uh, when he said that he was trying to persuade funders to to ditch reports and only do a sort of infographic plus a, a video. Yeah, and I have to not say, not going very well so far. But we're trying that. <laughs> uh, we're trying that. Keep um, trying, keep trying. Yeah. Okay, look, we've got three minutes left. Um, so catch my eye now, or we're going to go to uh, New York and uh, let Joe uh, come in. Let's go, Joe, and then and then Nick. Joe, some closing thoughts before you go to lunch. Can we um, Joe off move? Yeah. Closing thoughts. No, I wish I had, uh, um, had something really deeply profound to say. Um, I think, again, my um, what I would want to say is that I, um, the biggest thing I've been impressed with over the past year is just uh, just the extent to which everyone has uh, has really dived into new stuff and uh, um, tried out something new and then been willing to share with everybody else 
what they have done and how they have done it so that we can all learn from their processes. So that's, uh, that's fantastic. And I hope, I, um, hope year two sees a whole lot more of that very same thing. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, Nick. Uh, just quickly uh, on resources. Um, yeah, aim high. Uh, I think the big picture is not just the product, but the impact of the product. So 50-50 is something I like to say. If you've got a $50,000 product or 50,000 pound report, I want a 50,000 pound comms budget. And that otherwise, it's not, it, they're not tied together and it's not going to work. Um, and I think that digital allows you to test your approaches. And I really encourage everyone to do that try it a thousand different things, try it in a thousand different ways. And the bit that works, keep pressing that and keep exploring that avenue. And note that not everything you do and say is just going to work naturally. There are limited uh, applications to online. People's behavior online are limited to facile interactions and also peer-to-peer um, -peer stuff. They share things that they want other people to see reflecting their values and their ideas and so on. If you have a, a report that shows how horrible some situation is in um, a part of the world that really makes people feel bad, they won't share it. Um, but if you turn that into a story where we can actually change that, they will share it. Brilliant. Aim high, says the guy who uh, conquered Europe's highest skyscraper. I think that's a great way, that's a great thought to, uh, to end on. So um, Nick, Leonor and I are always thinking about what to do next. Um, uh, even though when we started, we didn't really think we were going to do anything next and then people said to us well, but when's your next event and i can't even tell you like when our next event is but um there's there's definitely a, a two uh, sort of theme ideas i think for year two of Wonkong. one is this marriage of emotion and insight uh, that that Bri and i uh, have talked about and another one is practicals Wonkong's practicals we, we kind of did a Wonkong's practical already we're sort of uh, in the market to franchise that out a bit. We've done uh, infographics. I think there's been talk about maybe best practice in social media and things like that. So there's definitely those two sort of um, themes, but we want your ideas too. We want you to bombard us with your ideas and then we'll ask you to help us make it happen to yeah. share the workload because as Nick said, we're all volunteers. Um, do stay in touch, um, uh, Twitter, of course, but the LinkedIn account I do think is, is, is where some really quality um, professional practice gets shared, Victoria. You'll, you will love it. Um, uh, contribute to the blog. We've, po I think, 52 different posts or, uh, on the WantComs blog. Nick set up this um, WordPress blog after our first event, and Leonora said, I'm not sure we're going to have enough people write for us, and I haven't really got time to do it. And a year later, we've done sort of one a week, basically. So keep sending us your ideas. Keep writing for us. Um, collaborate. Run the WantComs Twitter handle. Um, like we love Twitter, but we can't do it all the time. So people are doing two weeks at a time, uh, making the most of it. The Urban Institute in Washington DC are running at the moment. Hmm? It's America month. It's America month. It is America month. Um, so, uh, but at the end of America month, we'll need help <laughs> back to London, um, and uh, and come and have a drink because now we're all off and to the. There's a birthday cake. Oh, there's a birthday cake that we're going to have at the Blackfriars <laughs> Wine Bar, uh, just down the road. I need to, I need to make it. Right, I need to finish me. Not make it. I made. <laughs> you need to light, light the candles. <laughs> yeah. Light the candles. I well, I mean, it's only me, so I'm not in competition with right. them yet. Blackfriars Wine Bar, out of the front door, turn left. First on your left, you can't miss it. It's a big wine bar, basically. Right. Thanks, everyone. It's a big wine bar. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big wine bar. <laughs>